Jerome Merrill, anyway, and we'll be talking about matching algorithms for blood donation. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I'll be talking today about some sort of nascent work uh, at, at Facebook, uh, looking at designing a matching market for, for blood donation. And this is joint work with my, student, uh, my PhD student, Duncan McElfer, she's in the audience. Uh, Christian Crower, a variety of folks from Core Data Sciences and Econ CS at Facebook, co-directed by Nico Steyer Moses, who's in the crowd, and, uh, and, and Facebook Social Good as well. And so we have a, a very small working paper on some of this, and I'm happy to talk offline about some of the stuff that we haven't put sort of up publicly yet as well. Great. So safe blood is a scarce resource, and I emphasize safe here um, for a couple of reasons that will become evident in the coming slides. So every two seconds, somebody in the US needs blood. Developing countries specifically face chronic shortages of blood, and these particularly impact children and pregnant mothers and mothers who have recently undergone childbirth. Okay, so children have severe anemia due to, say, mal malnutrition or malaria, and women have complications from pregnancy or childbirth. Indeed, over 99% of roughly 500,000 women who die during childbirth every year during pregnancy are in developing nations. And the primary cause for this is some form of hemorrhage, which uh, unsurprisingly involves uh, a significant amount of blood transfusion. And so if there's a chronic shortage of blood, uh, then you're going to also have a chronic issue with dealing with these hemorrhage issues. Ditto, there is disparity between where people live and where blood donation occurs. So about 40% of the blood collected each year is donated in developing countries, whereas over 80% of the world's population lives in developing countries. And I have a little picture here uh, from Times of India this year um, on a World Donation Day talking about the shortage uh, of blood uh, estimated in India. So this is just one example. Blood donation, so blood has to be donated. It can't be synthesized. It has to be donated. Blood donation is handled differently worldwide. And donation rates and norms also vary worldwide. And I just have a couple of examples up here. There are a couple of very nice books and, and papers that have come out recently from Oxford. There's a book called Nine Pints that was written just kind of about the history of blood throughout the world that has a couple of great chapters on the history of blood donation. Very, very interesting read. I've just put a couple of examples up here. So in the US, for instance, uh, the US mixes state and private run donation. So about 40% of blood in the US comes through the American Red Cross. It's unsurprising. About 50% is going to come through community donation centers, and then about 10% will uh, occur via direct donation at hospitals. So that's sort of not surprising for those of us who live in the US. Each of these are considered state? Uh, oh, this is interesting. Uh, yeah, so state money, I guess, is going into a lot of these. Yeah, yeah, I should be a little more direct with the way that I use this. Um, I mean, ARC is, is formally a private. Yeah, that's right. Um, China, for instance, has state control over donation centers, right? And this is a function in part from uh, around 1998 when uh, a blood donation law was put into effect that was basically meant to standardize testing before blood donation occurred. There was a very famous incident in China where tens of thousands of people were infected by HIV-laden blood because of lack of testing, basically, uh, of donors. And so this blood donation law in 98 was passed to try and regain confidence in the blood donation systems uh, in China, and it's actually had a huge and, and very beneficial impact on donation rates. And they run a mix of quota and volunteer-based donation. Quota as in you have to donate X amount of blood units per year. Pick another country, Brazil. Uh, donation there is increasingly federally run. Uh, previously, it was sort of state-run, and, uh, and this had the same sort of issues that existed in, in China and another, uh, a bunch of other countries, which is you know, people didn't trust the system, and so donation rates were down. And, uh, and issues with the blood supply rips. And recently, they've shifted uh, to fully non-remunerated -re uh, donations, so donation as opposed to paying for blood. Blood donation rates thus vary widely across countries. You can see, actually, that donation rates in countries uh, are impacted by trust in the system. So if you look at like the UK or the US, people generally trust the American Red Cross or uh, donation systems uh, associated with the NHS in the UK. And so donation rates are high. And these drop, for example, with income. So if you look at high-income countries, about 3.2% of people donate once or more per year. And this drops steadily to full low-income countries where only half a percent of people donate every year. And finally, the World Health Organization recommends that basically everything is coordinated 
by, uh, by a nation, at the nationwide scale, the entire blood supply chain. Okay, so this goes all the way from blood collection, which I'll be focusing on in this talk, to blood testing, processing, storage, distribution, and so on. So this is the full blood supply chain, and they recommend that this is handled, at least in a lightweight way, via policy at the nationwide level. One reason for this is that, well, it's hard to get safe and regularly supplied blood without some sort of high-level hand here. So uh, one emphasis that if you look at you know, the ARC or WHO, they really like to pitch voluntary unpaid blood donation as a method for getting safe blood. And this is backed up by a lot of research. So voluntary unpaid blood donors, these are folks who give blood of their own free will without receiving any form of cash or income payment are the key to ensuring safe blood donation. This is from the WHO. And ditto, these voluntary blood donors are also the safest donors because they're already educated. Uh, uh, they tend to donate multiple times. They're experienced. They tend to live a healthier lifestyle. And this just makes testing easier and better. Great. So I mentioned the full blood supply chain. This starts, obviously, with finding blood donors who then donate blood. That blood is collected and processed and tested. This goes into, say, storage for some number of days before going bad, uh, inventory management, and so on. And then finally into distribution and actual transfusion uh, in a hospital, so into a needy patient. There's been a lot of work in this space, which is a good thing because this is such a worldwide issue. There's a lot of operations research, optimization, CS, econ, et cetera work that's been done on the collection and processing side, the storage and inventory side, and the distribution and transfusion side. Okay, and so here's a pointer to a nice recent lit review that covers something like 120 papers since the 1960s, basically written on this chunk of the supply chain. <coughs> Obviously, there has been some work on the donor side, but most of the optimization-based work here focuses on basically predicting supply or predicting demand. So you know, given a demand spike, such as a natural disaster, how can I predict supply of donors in a particular region? that sort of problem. So our work here is going to be the focus on, on just the donor recruitment side. Okay. So not the collection and processing, and so on. So blood donation at Facebook. I mentioned Facebook. This is a, a Facebook team that's, that's run. Yeah? Question about that uh, impact of, say, a natural disaster or some other disaster that requires blood. Is the typical way in which this is done is we have a certain uh, stock, a disaster happens, we expect to use the stock, and then the new donations are just replenishing the stock? Or is it more we need the new donations in order to, and I'm sure there's heterogeneity. It really depends on the country. So there are, there are countries uh, that uh, do not have a steady supply of blood, and in fact, uh, basically, when you get blood in a hospital, you're basically told, hey, you need to replenish exactly the blood units at exactly the type of blood that you got, you know, or we'll be angry for some value of angry. Uh, and that's not even during a demand spike. So that's just the, the way their system works. So during a demand spike, you'll see, you know, like WhatsApp will light up with, with blood donation requests, you know, P2P basically blood donation. And so that's part of what this, this Facebook product is trying to solve. Yeah. Great. So Facebook blood donation product connects uh, millions of donors with opportunities to donate in several countries around the world. Okay. So here are a couple of quotes. Uh, in June of 2019, uh, from Facebook's newsroom, so this is public information, there were more than 35 million people who had signed up to be blood donors on the platform in a variety of countries. At the time, Brazil, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. This has since launched actually in, in the U.S. as well. So uh, uh, some, country, or sorry, some cities here in the U.S., for example, D.C., where I live, uh, are also uh, able to now use this product. Some initial work has been done to survey impacts of, say, Facebook products on blood donation. So centers in India and Brazil found that 20% of people said that Facebook influenced their decision to donate blood according to in-person surveys conducted at those partner blood banks. And so this number you know, is fuzzy, obviously. It's, it's in-person surveys. It's in a particular country. But it's still an exciting uh, uh, measure, noisy measure of impact here. Great. So what does the product look like? Well, you have two sides of the, sort of the market here. One is blood recipients. I'm using recipient here to say a hospital, a blood drive, a blood bank, uh, even individuals. And via this product, they can state their need and location. Okay, so I am at position X, I'm a hospital. I have a need for a particular type of blood in this case. 
The other side, blood donors, these are you know, the 35 million plus folks who have signed up as blood donors, they can find donation opportunities and can choose to receive push notifications about those opportunities. So here's a lever that we can play with when we notify somebody who has signed up. Right? So maybe they have some budget for how many times they want to be notified, or maybe there's some self-imposed budget on the firm side, in this case Facebook side, that says we will only push a notification to a user once every k days. Say k is equal to 14 or 21. Okay. So we can play around with that lever to try and respond to express demand. In this talk, I'll be discussing uh, the primary research question that our team has been focusing on, which is notifying donors to increase donations. Okay, so when do we choose to do these push notifications subject to a set of business constraints? And how do we do this equitably, initially across the recipients? Okay, so no, say, single hospital that happens to be located in an area of very high population gets you know, all of the pushes and thus all of the impact of this product. How can we do this equitably across recipients and then eventually equitably across the donors as well? Great, so I'll pause here. Any questions so far? Cool. There was one. Oh, oh. hey, thanks. Just to understand the context, this is like a hospital has some uh, special need or demand spike, and that's why they need. Uh, so, so is this more for uh, developing countries that doesn't have a good system, or is it more for, uh, like, say, even in the U.S., if there's some special need? Uh, can you talk a little bit more about? Uh, sure. So I'm going to answer that with uh, the non-exclusive or, which is yes to both of those. So this product came out of initially a focus on the developing, uh, some developing nations. So let, let's focus on, say, India or Brazil. So here are our two countries, and they have vastly different. Donation systems, but um, uh, in India, for instance, uh, P2P blood requests are very common. So I know I'm going to the hospital. I'll contact my, my, my say my social network, you know, my mom, my dad, etc., and I'll say, you know, for those of you with a particular compatible blood type, can you please come to this center with me, this this hospital with me, and provide blood that I need? So that was common on a variety of platforms. You can imagine SMS. You can imagine other other platforms as well. Um, and so this product came out of basically trying to do a better job of doing that matching process. Now, obviously, if you're allowing individuals to request blood, why not allow you know, other you know, blood banks, blood drives, hospitals, et cetera, to request blood? And there are always going to be shortages that occur sometimes, even in countries such as the US, where uh, uh, the blood donation system is a lot more uh, organized. Yeah. But the, the product initially came out of that developing country motivation. So uh, I'm a man with a hammer, and that hammer is matching. So let's view this as a matching problem. Problem description, matching supply and demand. OK, so we have recipients. These are the hospitals or people. I mean, some of them are static. Hospitals don't tend to come and go. Some of them are static, like blood banks. Some of them are also dynamic. OK, so I could have a blood drive. For instance, there might be you know, World Blood Donation Day in June. So there's basically worldwide, there's always a, a drop in blood donation in May and June uh, for a variety of reasons. and so. Uh, 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 I might have a blood drive in May, or I might have ad hoc requests. Okay, so this is one side. These are recipients, and I'm going to call them recipients R, and some sort of time-indexed set of recipients. Okay, so this can change with time potentially. Uh, we have supply. In this talk, I'm going to treat this as a static set of donors. Okay, so we're going to assume that there are a static set of donors, and people aren't arriving and departing. Uh, that should be relaxed in the future. And they will donate with some probability only after receiving a notification. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to assume that they won't donate unless we push notify them. And if we push notify them, then with some probability that maybe we have to estimate, they'll then go to a donation center. And we'll get you know, utility from that. So edges here are going to be potential notifications that I can send. And a matching is going to be the selection of some of those edges that actually result in push notifications. And these edges, again, are going to be indexed by time. They can change, right? A person maybe uh, uh, goes out of the city for a week, and edges to uh, donation centers in that city will disappear, and so on. The weight is going to be a probability of action, right? So it's, uh, 
unlike maybe some other matching applications where probability is the probability of this edge existing, well, that's going to be, uh, I can just treat that as a weight here as well, right? Uh, and these will change over time. Great. So viewing this as an optimization problem, again, we have a set of edges that I can select from at a time t. I'll index edges coming out of a donor uh, uh, using ED, and edges going into a recipient using ER. And then we have edge weights, time dependent, that we estimate from data. Okay, and this is actually a huge problem in general, which is, you know, how do I estimate the probability that John, if he receives a push notification at time t, will actually go and donate to a center, right? Uh, I'll be using the standard decision variables here, which are going to say, given an edge e at time t, I'll use a binary variable and set it to 1 if I choose to notify on that edge and set it to 0 otherwise. And I mentioned some constraints. So one constraint I'll talk about in the present lecture is uh, a self-imposed constraint, which says that I can only push notify a user. I can only select an edge in the outgoing set of edges from a donor uh, every k time periods. Okay. So say if k is, if I'm doing matches and batches once a day, maybe I'll set k to 7, and I can only notify once every 7 days, once a week. And we can write that as a constraint, saying I can only use my binary variable associated with edges coming out of a donor once or zero times every t time period, or k time periods. Great. So we're working toward defining an optimization problem here. We've talked about decision variables, parameters for the model, constraints. What's the point, right? We don't want to just find a feasible allocation here. We want to maybe maximize some objective. Uh, I'll focus on two objectives here. One is sort of the obvious one, which might be to maximize realized donations. Right. Exactly what you think. We have a total weight of a matching, and it's going to be the sum over all our time periods of the edges that exist at that time of whether or not we use them times uh, the weight, which is the probability that they converted. And uh, treating users either recipients and or donors fairly is also important. So we can have uh, different objectives that encode forms of fairness. Here's one that we're going to experiment on a bit, which is this maximum in utility. So this is going to basically say, hey, uh, given all of the recipients, all the blood banks, all the hospitals, here's the utility of what they got. I want to maximize the minimum of that. Not saying it's the right one, just saying it's one that we could use. So let me give a concrete example matching problem, very toy, right? We have, uh, say, a horizon of three. We're allowing a user to be matched at most once every three time periods. So in this example, each of these three users can be matched at most once. In time period one, we have this hospital H1 that exists and can be matched, let's say everybody's within a certain range, uh, to each of these three donors. And I've associated with this hospital a single weight, uh, 0 0.1, and that's going to be for every one of these edges for now. In reality, obviously, every one of those edges has its own unique weight. This is just an, a very toy example. In day two, a new recipient arrives, say a blood drive, can be matched to anybody in the pool still. And then at day three, uh, two folks leave and one new folks comes in. Okay. Yep. Is the only thing that couples periods that can start talking about the number of notifications mm -hmm. in that window? In this toy model, yeah. But in the original formulation as well. Right? I mean, could if you didn't have that constraint, you could solve it day by day separately, right? Uh, he's asking if the only thing that couples time periods. What couples one time period to another? Uh, so we have a static set of donors on one side of the market. We have a possibly evolving set of vertices V that can arrive online on the other side. And. Uh, yeah, so one coupling point is uh, whether or not we've, we've chosen to match a particular donor in the... Not in the model that I'm talking about in this talk. That's right. Not in the model that I'm talking about in this talk. So in reality, uh, yeah. the, the answer to that is very different, yeah. yeah. So the rationale for that constraint of notifications is that just kind of one implementation of the constraint that you can't donate blood every day because 
you going to die after a week? Or? Uh, no, actually, this is coming primarily, uh, at least from my understanding, uh, from not wanting to uh, uh, ruin a user's uh, experience with, in this case, the product. So there are going to be hard constraints on push notifications for a variety of, of things. You know, even if you could donate blood every one hour, then you wouldn't want to be push notified to donate blood every one hour. Yeah. That's actually an assumption, right? I mean, it could be that people who initially volunteer, because right, I have to sign up for this, or people who are publicly minded, and they actually have a utility to get one more donation push than one more ad for some dumb product. Right? That's absolutely right. And in fact, the model that I'm going to talk about that we're working to apply to this problem is going to assume reusable resources that, where this, this person gets matched and they disappear for some number of time periods that can be specific to the user and may be drawn from a distribution. Uh, and that distribution could be very short for somebody who's, say, socially minded and very long for somebody else. That's right. That's right. Yeah? Do you know for an individual user that got a push notification whether or not that user when to donate blood? Absolutely not. And this is a huge issue. Okay. Yeah. So, so we don't actually know whether or not an hour later the user would be able to donate because Yeah. So this is this is the big problem, right? Is uh, you can use proxy events, for example, to try and you know gain uh, some insight into whether or not a user acted on a push notification. But no, no, no. Um, I, I mean I would love to see in the future some sort of deeper relationship with the blood center where you're able to say, hey, you know, for this set of blood centers, uh, we, in a specific city, we hit a, a bunch of, say, donors with, with, with push notifications uh, who actually converted to a donation. Uh, but at the moment, no. The answer is no. Yeah. Can they, like, check other options when they, were get, when they get the notification? Like, if I'm a user, I got this notification, I got a match to a blood drive, but it's too far away. I want to check if I have some other blood drive that's near my house. Do you have the opportunity to like search for it or? Um, yeah. So the base product, if you if you enter into that, uh, and again, this might be different across different countries. If you enter into that as a potential donor, then you can actually browse a fairly long list, and obviously it's ordered in, in a particular way. A fairly long list of donation events uh, and requests, and this is ordered by you know the standard ordering that com comes with lists like this. Um, so the answer is yes. Yeah. yeah. So when you get a push notification, that'll take you into this part of the product, and then at that point, you know, you're one one uh, click away. So push notification could trigger somebody to donate, but not necessarily to the yeah. recommendation that you gave them. Right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So this is, I mean, this is something we'll actually have to do, like sort of boots on the ground. Uh, yeah. This is a very sort of new product. So yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So what is the relevant time scale for a blood bank? Like, how long can you store blood, or like, at what time scale do fluctuations in their reserves happen? That's right. Um, order of say thirty-ish days for storing blood. Uh, again, this is I hate, I hate to keep using this answer. It depends on the country. Uh, this is an answer I'm very familiar to, you know, give when I talk about kidney exchange as well. Um, it depends on the country, but let's say order of thirty, order of, of some small number of weeks. But that small number of weeks is actually set to be uh, higher right now than say the constraint that we can't push to users more than K. So it's, it's something greater than K at the moment. Yeah, and this also depends on the type of product that you're getting from blood, you know, blood versus platelets versus plasma versus blah, 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 blah. But let's say order of multiple, but not that many tens of days. Yeah? You may only answer this indirectly, but how do you know when the donor is actually off your sort of target audience? Because let's say they've already donated. So how do you know whether you, you stop or stop we, sending the messages? Uh, we don't. So if they donated outside of the product, let's say that I went to a blood donation center while I was walking to Simon's today, uh, I might still get a push notification if I haven't been pushed within these constraints. So there's not an opt-out sort of at least in the app sense to... Uh, I'm not sure what the answer to that is. I, I can't see a reason why that wouldn't be the case, though. I mean, you would hope so. Yeah. yeah. Great. <laughs> so we went down a rabbit hole. The point I wanted to make here is that there can be a difference between our two objective functions, right? If I take the total weight matching in this very toy example here, then I might match all of my users to the, you know, this particular hospital here. I might get a uh, utility of 1.5 for that. But if I look at the maximum utility, well, I have two recipients that receive nothing, and so that's zero. Whereas if I choose, say, a maximum policy, an omniscience, you know, I know my entire rollout here, then I might choose to smooth out the notifications across my recipients, which will result in a loss in weight. Not surprising to anybody here. Cool. 
So maybe starting to address the question that was asked a bit earlier, well, let's say that we are able to perfectly predict for a given fixed horizon, we can perfectly predict the existence of all edges, all weights, all recipients, all donors. Uh, it's not surprising that we could write down a nice formulation for this, where I'm going to incorporate into my objective some sort of max weight matching plus lambda times some function q, which is going to encode some form of fairness, maybe some smoothing, maybe some sort of maximum utility, et cetera. If I write down this omniscient policy, then you know maybe I could solve for an optimal policy given this, this rollout. Interestingly, this is uh, a, a, an MP-complete problem. The decision problem is MP-complete um, for basically any instantiation of the problem. So if we have this, this k donor rate limit, if that's greater than 1, if I uh, am disallowed from hitting a particular user exactly every time period if I want to, so basically no limit, uh, and for most objectives that you would expect. Right? So as long as my fairness function is, is, a, is a kind function, uh, then I, I, I have this result here. So if we're omniscient, that IP uh, needs to be an IP uh, and can get very large. So think Facebook scale. Yep. It seems like it could very much be the sort of IP that gets very large, but uh, the fractional solutions are very close to being Integer. Yes, I think that's true. Uh, we haven't explored that much simply because we're never going to use, well, we probably won't use this. Okay. Um, I think that's probably true. And there's a lot of structure as well, right? Like 35 million registered donors, you know, some number of tens of millions of registered donors, but the number of edges, are, there's going to be some structure, obviously, to this, right? Uh, there's structure to me being matched to, to San Francisco area. Blood banks. Yeah. And so, you know, if you're an IP person, you can start doing de decompositions, and maybe you could actually solve this optimally. Um, not a big focus right now, though. IP? Oh, integer program, sorry. Yeah, the harder LP. Great. So we do have distributional information. We have partial information. And this is sort of one push that we're taking right now. For this audience, I'm not going to go into this. But you can imagine planning this as you know, a stochastic optimization problem uh, where we, we go down sort of the rabbit hole of doing optimization stuff, which uh, if you've been to other talks of mine, this is something I really enjoy doing. But for this talk, uh, I want to connect this back to, say, matching theory. Okay. Uh, but before I do this, are there any questions on the model? Okay. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. How does this connect to some of the things that we've been talking about for the last couple of days? You know, uh, online matching from sort of a, a theoretical lens. Right? So let's talk again about one sort of standard form of online matching. We have a bipartite graph, uh, u and v. Uh, on either side of this graph, we have edges between them. We're going to know u entirely offline. In the context of this problem, those are going to be my donors. v, in this case, will arrive sequentially. Okay, so one by one. v arrives one by one. This is already not realistic in this setting because uh, some of our recipients exist for a long period of time. For instance, Johns Hopkins isn't going to go away after one time period. Uh, and some uh, arrive in batches as well. But I'm going to talk about open problems after this. We have a, a, a fixed t time steps. And at every step t, so John, instead of V representing uh, recipients, could I think of it as representing demand shocks? Uh, so you could think, you know, let's say Johns Hopkins exists all the time, but a disaster happens, now Johns Hopkins needs 40% more blood. That could be the same as a pop-up donation place popping up that needs roughly 40% of what Johns Hopkins needs. Right. Right? So I think that's right. I think that's right, yeah. So we would have some clump of so offline like, baseliners or something like that. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah, in fact, I, I would love to talk about that more offline because that's a little bit further outside of my area of expertise. Again, I have my hammer, and that hammer is, is going to be matching in this case. But I think there are isomorphic things. Yeah, yeah. I think that might be a nice scalable way to handle this as well. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, say, a blood drive could be a demand center sort of a demand spike, right? Yeah. The R is a problem, but maybe the objectives are not the same. So if you want to guarantee fairness, the baseline will guarantee some fairness across all these hospitals, but maybe not in terms of the extra demand that may right. happen at some point. Right. That's true. Mm -hmm. So yeah, happy to talk more. Yeah. Cool. But coming back to sort of standard online matching, which I'll then try uh, to cast our problem into. So at every time step t, we have some sample of a vertex v who arrives, uh, let's say, independently. Uh, from some known distribution, D. Okay, so in a lot of problems such as advertising or this one, we have a pretty good distributional 
uh, estimate of the distribution from, from which v might be drawn. Uh, in the standard model, we're going to assume that a vertex v must be assigned immediately and irre irrevocably to a vertex on the u side. Right? So uh, a vertex v arrives. We choose to reject or match. That match is set in stone. So in this case, that match would be a push notification. So if I decide to push notify you at t, I can't then remove that push notification in most uh, 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 settings at time t plus 1 and then reallocate it. Right? Standard assumptions, t is very large, and v is very large relative to the offline side u. And typically, we have some typically linear function f over the matched edges e that we want to, say, maximize an expectation. All right? So we're trying to find some algorithm that finds a matching that's going to maximize this function over the matched edges, uh, maybe the expectation of that. So sort of a fast and loose uh, cast uh, overview of the standard uh, online matching problem. Great. So I'll talk about two papers that I think are the closest to addressing the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, and they're both going to use reusable resources. So we're going to take this motivation, which is that in many applications, offline vertices, that U side, are going to be matched uh, and only remove temporarily from the pool before returning. Rideshare is a good example of this. If we consider the drivers to be offline vertices, then they're matched to a request. You know, maybe they pick the person up. They're off of the Uber app for 15 minutes, or if you're in DC, for the next 75 minutes, uh, and then you reappear. Uh, you know, network connect connection management, maybe there's an AP, you're connecting to Edge Room, and there's another person connected, so it fails uh, for a while until that person leaves. Uh, or organ allocation, uh, maybe a recipient receives a kidney, and that lasts for some, uh, 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 some draw, right? Some, in this case, integral draw of time from a distribution. So there have been a couple of papers, uh, one uh, from our group at, at Maryland, and one that I'm going to mention from uh, groups here uh, in Simons uh, that are going to incorporate into this model these reusable offline resources. Okay, so what does that mean? We have an offline vertex U. If it's matched according to an E, an edge E, uh, it's going to reappear later in time according to some random draw from a known distribution, an integral draw. Okay? We'll call that CE. And I'm going to talk about the known IID case of arrivals here. Uh, a couple of papers, including this one, also uh, extend this into the known adversarial distributions case. So we have Mohammed here in the front row, so we could talk about profit inequalities. But for this setting, I'll just talk about KIID. Okay. Yeah, actually, there was another paper of us in 2005, EC 2005, that we are talking exactly about these reusable items. Ah. Uh, that one. We should walk down the hall in the university we share at some point and talk about this one. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would love to see that because uh, in this paper and also in another paper that comes from folks in the audience, I'll have a slide on. Uh, I didn't see that cited in either of these. So. Yeah, this one, actually, we have it also with reusable items, an online item which is reusable. Is that still coming from a known distribution or? Okay, so there, I mean, the items, they, they, the people, I mean, there, there's the distribution arrival of the agents, but each reusable thing they will come and they will say, for example, Wi Fi. Uh, resource. They say a Starbucks, there are 10 ports, and then each person is coming and takes some number of units from, like, for 10 minutes or for one hour, they are using this resource, and then after that, they will leave. Yeah. That one. So, in that sense, there is not uh, essentially distribution for the timing of that resource, but then there is a distribution on the arrival of the agents, essentially. Yeah, I see. Um, I think that's a little different. I think it's a little different than this. Uh, th I'm trying to cast this problem, and, and I'll, I'll do one to cast into stochastic online scheduling, which I think might be more similar to the problem you're talking about. Um, the motivation can be a little different. So we can actually recast this problem uh, in the language of SOS, stochastic online scheduling, where we have, say, non-identical parallel machines. They're static. Um, we have V jobs that are going to arrive uh, sequentially. So at every time step T, we're going to sample at most one job with some probability. Uh, each type of job is going to be able to be processed non-preemptively, to use the language of this world. So this is irrevocably. Once I assign it, I can't move it. Non-preemptively on a subset of U. These are the edges between U and V. When a job V is assigned to a machine U, we'll get some profit WE. This is not the typical objective. That's the objective if we cast our problem into the space. 
machine U will be occupied for some number of rounds. This world, and I, Mohammed maybe could dive deeper into this as well, uh, the motivation is typically a bit different, and the, the model is typically a bit different than what we're talking about, too. So the motivation here is typically you know, minimize make span, and we're looking to maximize some weight and maybe do some sort of fairness as well. Cool. So the benchmark we're going to use, I guess in the interest of time, I'll sort of breeze through this, is going to be the competitive ratio. Higher is going to be better. The expectations we're taking over both of the numerator and the denominator here are going to be over randomness of both the algorithm and the arrival sequence in the numerator, and then in the denominator just over the arrival sequence. So it's sort of the standard competitive ratio you would expect for this setting. <coughs> so we'll take a common approach to designing ALG, right? And that's going to be to separate the algorithms into two phases. First, we're going to obtain an upper bound on an offline optimal solution, an LP, say. Then online, we're going to use the solution to that offline upper bound. We'll sample from it. It's some fractional, or it's a probability distribution. We'll sample from it, and we'll use it to guide our online matching algorithm. So in our case, actually, uh, the stochasticity of this problem uh, makes computing an offline optimal solution tricky. And so we rely on a bunch of intuition from other similar problems, of which there are many. Uh, the nice paper in Stochastic Knapsack by Ma in 2014, and some folks in Stochastic Matching as well. Cool. So we want to design ALG, and we want to do that uh, using information from some sort of upper bound on OPT. So if I knew uh, I had infinite computation, I can create some sort of optimal algorithm that's going to do maybe the best I can do in expectation. Okay. So here is an LP that is an upper bound on the expectation of opt. It's exactly what you might think. In this case, we're uh, just for sort of exposition, we're ignoring the fairness constraints here. We uh, want to maximize the sum of the weights of the edges that we use, subject to a couple of constraints. One is the probability that V is matched at any particular time t is upper bounded by the probability that that type of vertex arrived at time t. Right? Remember that we have access to this information. And that can change based on t, but we know that information. So the probability that an optimal matching actually uses an edge uh, is going to be upper bounded by the probability that the, uh, the, the source of that edge actually exists at that time period. And the second constraint, and this is sort of the, the trickier part, is we'll have another bound that says uh, the probability that u is still unavailable based on a previous assignment plus the probability that I end up matching t has to be bounded by, by 1, right? the matching constraint here. So remember, once I match an edge to a vertex on the U side, the offline side, it disappears for some random draw, integral random draw, before reappearing to be matched again. So this is a, an upper bound on the expectation of opt. We can use this in the standard way to design an algorithm, a non-adaptive algorithm, with a, uh, with a competitive ratio guarantee that I'll give. Okay? So let's solve that LP offline. We have distribution information that gives us a probability distribution over edges. And then we'll sample from this in the online phase. So we'll use a simulation-based algorithm to do this. It's going to be parameterized by a desired competitive ratio that uh, we show this is valid up to 0.5. Simple algorithm. So a vertex V arrives at time t. Uh, look at all of its edges. Call the ones that can be used, so that are matched to you that are still in the system, safe. If that edge set is empty, you can't do anything, so reject V. Otherwise, Take all of those edges that are safe and uh, sample one with this probability. And it's kind of an ugly probability, so I'm going to walk through it with little blue arrows. One is we're going to sample an edge with higher probability if it's more likely that an optimal algorithm would use that edge. We're then going to sample it with lower probability if it's more likely that, you know, if the vertex is really likely to arrive at that particular time, then we're going to say, well, you know, maybe I don't want to match this edge as much as if some sort of rare vertex arrived. We're going to sample a, a with higher probability if we're shooting for a higher competitive ratio. And then we're going to use this beta term, which is the probability that an edge is safe at a particular time t, which is to say the probability that the sync node, the u node, is unmatched at, at, at time t. And you can just learn that via simulation. Okay. So is the intuition behind the PVT coming from the fairness considerations? Um, no, because here we're just, uh, at least for this talk, we're only maximizing 
uh, sum of the weights of the edges that we're matching. Yeah, that's right. So our motivation here was actually in rideshare initially, and, and I'm, um, I, I'm going to talk about some edits that we need to make to this model before applying to blood donation. Now, this is really interesting. Uh, Google Scholar actually this morning recommended a recent working paper from two months ago from folks in the audience here. And I think it's actually looking at a very similar problem, so I'm not sure if uh, I've seen at least Rod and, and Amin here. Um, I'm not sure if either of them are in the audience, but they actually look at two different models in the assortment planning setting, one of which I think is exactly the same as what we're looking at. Okay, so they have a prior free model where vertex types are drawn uh, from arbitrary distributions, and we have a Bayesian model, which I think is actually identical to our model. So this is kind of cool to see. Their paper goes into a lot more depth and a different, uh, different sort of uh, uh, set of steps than ours, but we actually derive the same competitive ratio of 0.5 using a simulation-based algorithm from a similar uh, LP upper bound of the expected version of opt. And then they also do some stuff with adaptive policies. So it was nice to see this paper. Uh, basically, uh, uh, we've come up with the same results, which is pretty cool. Cool. So why was I talking about all that? Well, that's to sell this problem in part to this community, because neither of those models can be adapted immediately to the blood donation problem. Okay. So both of those papers derive a 0.5 competitive ratio uh, relative to that, to that LP upper bound, but it's not immediately applicable to the real donation case. We have a lot of assumptions here that might be broken. Right? One is, can we actually assume that our requests are much, much bigger than our offline vertices? It's unclear. Maybe we can play around with what a request means. It's unclear how to set t. We require extension to the batch setting, which is multiple v arrivals for every t. All right? So this is both sort of a realistic constraint just because of the size of the system, but also uh, a constraint on the back end because maybe there's uh, batch job processing that occurs every t time periods behind the scenes uh, at, at, say, Facebook to actually do these sorts of matchings. We need to match the immediate and irrevocable assignment assumption because some of these vertexes, vertices on the online side are actually there for quite a while, right? A blood donation, uh, blood drive does not appear and disappear in a single time period. It maybe exists for quite a while, or maybe there's a hospital that exists permanently. And none of this stuff has actually looked at the fairness definitions uh, or any sort of uncertainty on uh, like the weights of the edges that come in, right? The value of the edge if we happen to match it. So those are works in progress. In the interest of time, I'm going to kind of go through some of the Initial policies we're trying uh, uh, in reality, and then I'll leave you with some open problems that we can discuss that are really interesting to the community. So those, I think, are the two closest theoretical models to our problem. We're working on extending them. For now, though, uh, because this is a real-world problem, we can also experiment with some just heuristic policies for doing matching. Okay, so come back into the sort of real problem that we're trying to solve. What can you imagine doing? Right? Well, we have donors who are signed up for the program. We have recipients. We could just choose them randomly, right? The, the most heuristic of the heuristics. Probably this is fair to recipients. Probably. Uh, assuming some uh, distributional assumptions, but probably doesn't maximize weight. And that's the same result that we'll see uh, in reality, which I won't talk about in this talk, and also in simulation, which I will talk about. You can also imagine doing some sort of max weight myopic matching, right? So, uh, sorry, selection of edges. Visit donors in a random order, and then choose from all of the safe edges for that donor. Uh, I get, sorry, if, they, if we visit them, then they're safe. From all the edges of that donor, the one with the highest weight, the one with the highest conversion probability. Right? Probably not fair to recipients, because there's going to be these, say, hospitals that have a higher rate in general because they're, say, located very well. Probably pretty good in terms of maximizing short-term weight. And you can imagine other sorts of heuristics. Round robins on the recipient side, doing some sort of uh, like epsilon greedy style thing uh, on, on the donor side. Um, these are all heuristics that will result potentially in some sort of middle ground between total weight and fairness. Okay? And so we have these parameters, like how random you are across the recipients and how random you are across the donors. You can learn this from data, uh, saying basically, how can we balance this? Right? And there's very little overhead in terms of optimization. We're not solving a big integer program. We're not solving uh, even a big linear program offline to guide search. So in terms of simulations for this talk, this is not real data, but we've actually created some simulations that look like real data. So we create a city where people live. We create some donation centers. And we draw edges between the, city, uh, between the, the donors and the recipient, maybe based with some weight based on, uh, based on that distance. And we find, again, these are reasonably realistic, that the, the heuristics actually perform as we would expect. 
Random donation selection does very badly in terms of both efficiency and fairness. Round robin on the recipient side does a little bit better in terms of fairness, but worse in terms of total weight. And searching for max weight by selecting donors is going to do a pretty good job in terms of weight. And actually, behind the scenes, if you compare this to the offline optimal, it's actually doing pretty well compared to that, which is pretty nice to see. So one open theoretical question we have is that given realistic distributions, perhaps greedy does a pretty good job relative to offline optimal, but it does badly on fairness. And I'll leave on a complementary issue and some early conclusions, basically saying that one of the big issues here is actually not matching at all. Uh, it's just estimating those edge weights to begin with. So what's the probability of converting? It's even estimating that, right? We don't have access to whether or not somebody in the past actually did donate based on a push notification. We also, um, like having this off by a little bit can create a huge issue when it comes to telling how well your implementation is actually done, right? Likely we can't measure these direct donation events. You can use proxy events based on, say, notification engagement or search behavior to determine this. Uh, but in reality, I think this is actually going to be sort of a boots on the ground problem where we have to figure out by talking to donation centers what the conversions actually looked like. Okay? And even though I have my matching hammer that I've repeatedly talked about, my hunch here is that improvements here can actually help a lot more than improvements in the matching policy itself. So this is a nice complementary issue. So in conclusion, we're developing a notification policy for donors. We're interested in increasing donations, yes, but also equitably doing this to donors and recipients. In theory, most forms of this problem are MP hard, but what we've been seeing in our hunch is actually that heuristic solutions are very good here. There are a lot of interesting problems that we could look at as a matching theory community. And there's the unsurprising trade-off between overall edge weight and fairness, but we want to be able to parameterize and select that. Um, and so if you want to hear open problems, talk to me offline. question in the graphs you showed from your simulations, the um, greedy max weight, it looks kind of like a mean preserving spread of round robin, um, at least if I eyeball it. Yeah, that might also be a byproduct of the, the distributions we're drawing from. It's very, very sort of smooth. So we smoothed things out to be able to talk about them in this talk. Um, so we've lost a fair amount of information. That might be the case, though. Yeah. If there's something interesting to explore there about risk attitudes, you know, that uh, uh, yeah, spreads, yeah. you know, if you care about the max, that's going to be good. If you are more risk averse, you want the, uh, uh, you know, less barrier. Uh, uh, but I, I don't know if it's something worth exploring. I think that absolutely is. I, I would want to suss out exactly the, the distributional, like the simulation. Yeah, yeah, that's very important there, though. Okay, well, thank you very much. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we'll have our last talk of the day. Thanks again. So